Hi African Cream Mo channel family and friends. Hope you're doing okay. Hope everything's going well. I'm trying to see if I can get the right spot for the light. Eh, being a cameraman, we Hi everybody, how are you doing? Happy New Year! Happy New Year 2024! Welcome to my channel, my name is uh, African Queen Mo and I bring you uh, lots of interesting topics and uh, I like to discuss things to do with uh, sometimes politics, sometimes I show you around where I live, I live in Wales in the UK and sometimes I'll show you around where I'm driving and sometimes I'll just talk about topics that are of interest to us. So I'm one of those ones who are not quite easily boxed into a specific category. Um, at the moment, I have decided from uh, 2024 to focus on showing you where I am, continue doing that, but also start talking about things that are more relevant to our lives and things that might be affecting all of us globally. Uh, and of course, especially those who are based in Africa, Africa is my number one. You know, when I was trying to identify my you know, niche, it's kind of difficult to identify it. Um, I tried and I tried, I thought to myself, is it travel? Is it um, lifestyle? Is it cooking? Is it parenting? What is it? You know, is it relationships? And then I realized, actually, you know what? Because my background in terms of my studies, I studied human ecology. Human ecology is about the human environment. It's about, you know, your, your the human, in its ecology, the human in its environment, in its entirety. And therefore, I have to be kind of like well-rounded. We were taught in school that we need to be well-rounded individuals. We should not be just looking at one thing at a time, you know, and um, that is the ideal situation. So it's very important. You know, there was a there was a paper that we used to do in class seven when I was a student long ago. For those of you who remember general paper, those of you who scored A's are people like me because I was always interested in not just what's happening within me, but what's happening around me and globally. I work in the local, but also have a global view of life. So I hope that when you um, review my channel and when you look at the kinds of topics that I discuss, you will actually see that kind of trend and that kind of thread. Before I go on, let's, let me, let's get to the topic. Today, um, I wanted to discuss uh, one thing that's quite interesting. I've been talking about interesting topics. Huh? <laughs> The last few, few videos I've been talking about the wealth gap and the divide and now I want to talk about you know those elements in our society those things that help to reduce the wealth gap and what are those those are things like the government itself and its own programs and entrepreneurs like you and I and also farmers and the general civil society how we manage our life how we govern our entire lives including business okay determines to what extent we are able to achieve um, let, let's just say happiness, uh, a quality of life, and also elevate those who are very poor to come up into society. All right, so I was trying to understand why is it that based on the news, okay, that I've been encountering, a lot of investors are actually fleeing the markets. In Kenya, for example, we have an exodus of foreign investors who are fleeing, okay, the Nairobi Securities Exchange, okay? So there's a lot of investors that have fleed, fleed. <laughs> the stock ex exchange and uh this is based on for example i've been going through the business daily which is so informative by the way a lovely 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 paper since i subscribed i've been like oh my goodness what have i been doing so they say in this business daily of which date was this this was obviously last year obviously but later in the year they say oh yeah this is november of last year by, by November of last year, there were over 6,256 foreign investors had fled the Nairobi uh, Securities Exchange across nine months till the end of September. This is until the end of September, guys. So 6,000 people fleeing the stock exchange. And the question is why? Why is everybody fleeing? Why is, it, why is nobody wanting to work with Kenya? Why, is, why are people running away? Okay, so they say that uh, say that the wealth erosion at the Nairobi Securities Exchange has extended to the fourth quarter now, okay, of the year, despite gains in several large stocks since October. So apparently there were some large stocks in October. I'm not very good at this stock exchange business, by the way, guys, but I know that it is a measure of the securities of the country. All right, that's why it's called the Nairobi Securities Exchange. So, you know, it's a place where people invest in business they invest in ideas they invest 
in the country. So they say that according to the data from the boards, the equities market capitalization has fallen further to 1.4 trillion as of December 11th from 1.48. Okay, so from it, it, it moved down from 1.487 trillion at the end of September to 1.466 trillion. Okay, by December 11th. So it's, it's coming down. So unfortunately, what that means is that the capitalization of the equities market has fallen. And the losses in the quarter are greatly reduced from the third quarter when market capitalization tumbled from 1.66 trillion at the end of June. So it moved from 1.66 trillion at the end of June to 1.466 trillion, okay, by December 11th. So that's a huge, you know, that's a huge reduction. Yeah. So basically they're calling it uh, a 93.86 uh points from 95.22 points at the end of september so for those of you who understand uh these financials you know you understand what it means but for the rest of us all we know is that the nairobi securities exchange is dropping and it's dropping fast because a lot of investors are fleeing the market why are they fleeing the market okay according to the central bank boss Central Bank of Kenya boss, why is Kenya losing its edge on, you know, in the East African community? He says that, the, that they're blaming the competitiveness, you know, on the reduction in foreign direct investment, which is actually, you know, these securities exchanges. Foreign direct investment has reduced significantly. And also that is causing a concern for mass default. The CBK loan rate, uh, mass default has actually hit at 11 year high so the only thing that kenya has outperformed uganda and tanzania on currently in the region is in the growth of diaspora remittances which have in the past decade risen to become the country's top source of dollars ahead of agriculture and tourism earnings so think about it you know the only edge that we have in kenya is us who are living in the diaspora sending money home and I'm sure it's not me. It's those ones who are working double and triple shifts and who have families who they need to support back home. Okay. So, but they say that um, the Uganda, the, they say that this year the shilling has weakened against the currencies of Uganda and Tanzania by 18% for Uganda and 15.8% for Tanzania. Yesterday I was having a discussion. Let's put this one, you know, into reality. Yesterday I was having a discussion with my Ugandan friend in Uganda. We, she loves figures. She's always talking figures. And she told me, you know what? When they came to Kenya, it was just towards the end of the Moi era. That time they were exchanging 22 Uganda shillings for one Kenya shilling. By the time they stayed on another 10 years and they got into the Kibaki area, at that time they were exchanging, the Uganda shilling was exchanging about, uh, about 36 Uganda shillings to one Kenya shilling. So you see the Kenya shilling was getting stronger, was so much stronger. And now it has gone back down to between 19 and 20 Uganda shillings to one Kenya shilling, which means that the Kenya shilling has even gone down below what it was towards the end of the Moi era within one year. This is the change between 2022 to 2023. Yeah, just one year. So you imagine we're doing even worse now than the Moi era period. So this is what the CBK governor is basically saying that this year that the shilling has weakened against the currencies of Uganda and uh, Tanzania very greatly. Okay. And against the dollar, the shilling has depreciated by about 19.5% to 1.53 units since January. So by about 20%. So it's really, really crazy. Right now, I know we're exchanging the pound for almost 200 shillings. You know, it's, I know the other day that I was exchanging pounds at 196 or something like that, which is ridiculous. Because by the time that uh, I left Kenya, we were exchanging pounds at something like about maybe 145, something like that, which was about uh, 2022, just before the elections. It's about maybe 140 something. We're definitely not at 196. This is ridiculous. Yeah. So basically what is happening is that the Kenya external debt service costs as a ratio to GDP stands at 3% ahead of Uganda, 2.3% and Tanzania, 
six percent okay so we are servicing our debt at a much higher percentage three percent okay which is literally double that one of tanzania which is 1.6 percent so we're using double the amount of money every year to service our debt compared to tanzania and much more than uganda which is 2.3 percent okay which is unbelievable i hope you understand what that means it means we're doing poorly we're doing really pretty poorly uh, there's also something else that the governor said, and this governor is called Dr. Thuge. He has been calling into question the management of the currency by his predecessor, uh, Dr. Patrick Njoroge, saying that the CBK, the Central Bank of Kenya, then had used forest reserve to artificially prop up the shilling. So the shilling has been artificially propped up all this time, apparently, according to him. But uh, what is important is to say that um, he said that the point we want to make is that we have been losing competitiveness. Our level of exports to GDP has been declining consistently. We are not getting uh, as much tourism receipts as our neighboring countries. And our foreign direct uh, investment has also declined. So income from tourism, income from foreign direct investment, income from agriculture has declined so much that the only place that we are actually playing anything, only place we're playing ball, uh, we can say that our economy is thriving. The only thing that is helping to prop up our economy, can we say, when it comes to Forex, is through diaspora remittances. Yeah, which is unbelievable. So, anyway, I thought that was quite interesting, guys. You know, um, so that's it. That's a fact. We have, we've heard it. CBK governor, he has said it himself. Yeah, who are you and me to, to question the CBK governor? <laughs> I don't think we're going to be questioning him when he says that we have an issue here. Yeah, and that we know that 42% of foreign investors have fled the Nairobi uh, Securities Exchange in nine months. Eh? They're fleeing, they're taking off. And you know who is telling us off right now as we speak? Hmm? The president of Tanzania. She is laughing at us. In fact, I wouldn't really say that she's laughing at us. What she's doing is that she's warning us. She's saying that since um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, an article that I came across where she was saying, Something very interesting, if I can find it. Eh? She was actually saying, what? What is this woman saying? Hey, she's really given us a thrashing. Oh, here she is. Here she is. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. President Suluhu mocks the burning neighbor losing investors to Tanzania. So all our investors are going to Tanzania, you people. Hmm? She said, Tanzania president, this is by Kevin Cheruyot. This is his own report in the Nation newspaper. And he said, as of which date? Let me quote the Nation newspaper nicely before they start coming after my neck. July 20th, 2023. Okay. That was in the Nation newspaper online. Yeah. And it's saying, according to President Suluhu, investors will not stay in an unstable environment that threatens their businesses. Okay. She says, Katia Mwezi wa May na Juni tumepokea wawezi wawekezaji wengi mno. Lakini... Ukitazama sababu ni nini? Sababu ni kwamba kwa jirani kuna wakamoto. <laughs> what she's saying is, between May and June, we receive many investors like never before. As you can see, the reason is that the neighbor's home is on fire. You know which neighbor she's talking about? She's talking about us. She's talking about Kenya. Kenya is the only neighbor that's actually, she's considering to be on fire. She made those remarks in Zanzibar, on Sunday, July 16th, while addressing a women's conference to mark the Islamic New Year. So she's really proud of herself. She's proud of the performance of Tanzania. And she was saying, she was stressing the need to maintain peace and stability in Tanzania, saying that that's the only way to attract investors. And she was appealing to them and telling them to maintain harmony and peace, saying that um, she warned the leaders that if they continue, you know, shouting around and fighting around you, squabbling, literally squabbling yeah that those investors who want to invest in the country may change their minds and opt to go for other similar countries so she praised the executive director of the tanzania investment center tic um who said in a recent interview that tanzania had received many investors this year it was not the first time that suluhu had made such a remark so basically in the end she said at the moment many countries are complaining of inadequate foreign exchange listen to this one so that you feel pain what President Suluhu says, she says, at the moment, many countries are complaining hmm, 
about inadequate foreign exchange, but for us, we have a stock that can last for four years. But yet, if you go to our neighbors, you know who our neighbors are? They don't even enough, have enough stock to last a week. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to laugh at ourselves, guys. It's so painful, we have to laugh. Hmm? You know, I don't know whether to laugh or cry, yeah? We don't have enough foreign exchange earnings to last a week. But Tanzania has foreign exchange earnings to last four years, people. Okay? Yes, we have to compete. We have to look at our neighbors and say, what are they doing different? What is it that they're doing different? And why is it that they're doing so well? Meanwhile, President Ruto today, in the newspaper of today, Monday, the headline is here. My plan is being sabotaged. In reference to the housing levy, he's, he's actually quoting this gentleman called Senator Omtata, who has taken this matter to court and also appealed the decision. But basically what he's saying is that the court already ruled that the housing levy was unfair and therefore, you know, he doesn't see why people should have to continue paying the housing levy up until January 10th because, you know, the court said, okay, well, you can continue deducting the housing levy off the salaries of people which is, you know, according to him, illegal. Because already, the same court already said that it was not fair. Yeah, it was considered to be unconstitutional. And you know, the housing levy was supposed to put up about 250,000 houses every single year, but it has been stopped by the courts. And so, President Ruto is really very upset. He said that it was quashed by the High Court for being discriminatory and it only targets 3.2 million Kenyans who are in formal employment. And you see that it, that is actually 3.2 million Kenyans out of a population of how many who are employable. Yeah. So we know that the majority of people are not in formal employment. Most people, about 80% of the population are in informal employment. And so if they're not going to be paying that housing levy of about 3%, half of which is supposed to be paid by the employee and the other half is supposed to be paid by the employer, then in that case, it is unconstitutional because it is unfair. It is only applied on a segment of the population um, who may not any, even benefit from those houses. That is the problem. There's this wrangle out there. And uh, according to President Trutu, he feels that his project is being attacked by only a few individuals. But, you know, my issue is that he says his plan is being sabotaged. And my concern with uh, President Ruto is this. Why is it that immediately, you know, his reaction goes there? Why? For what reason? <laughs> it's very clear, okay, that there are countries that have managed to attract foreign direct investment, tourism dollars, okay, that can fund a project like this one, such as Tanzania, such as Botswana. I've been doing my research on Botswana, you people. That is a place to put money in their securities exchange as well. You know, they have so much foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investment, more than they ever need. Countries like Botswana, any of you guys who have money, any of you guys who are thinking of doing business, think about doing business with countries like Botswana because they have a very thriving um, stock exchange. Very, 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 very thriving stock exchange. I was doing my research on it, and one day I'm going to talk about it here because we don't have enough time. But basically what we want to see is this. No, Omtata is not trying to sabotage you, President Ruto. No, he is not, as an individual, trying to sabotage you. What he is doing is trying to ensure that the law is implemented as it's supposed to be fairly for all Kenyans. So I feel that the Kenyan government needs to do more to attract foreign direct investment. Don't look at the only resource for your housing project as the same people of Kenya who you are taxing left, right, and center. Yeah, Kenyans are paying a lot of taxes. Like I discussed in my two wealth gap videos that preceded this one, I discussed the wealth gap and I explained to you how the government had, had to forego about 75 billion shillings in 2022 from lack of collection of taxes for commodities that it imported now i was talking to somebody okay within the agricultural sector one of the older people one of the older scientists in agriculture i talked to him recently to find out what is it that has changed and what he has said to me is number one we have had years and years of drought climate change is real you know, we've had years and years of drought that has affected our productivity, it has not also improved based on technology. We haven't been able to implement technology adequately to boost our productivity, such as Israel, for example, where Kenyans are going there to work. 
to work in their farms and yet we know Israel is a desert. Okay, so that's number one. Number two, and which is very important, is that agriculture, which used to be a national good, has now become devol de devolved to the counties. So what happens is that because agriculture is devolved, it means that the counties are actually um, prioritizing tendering, tenderpreneurs, tendering, that is importing food rather than promoting production of food locally by the farmers. Yeah, and also purchasing of food within the region as opposed to purchasing food from outside the region. You know, you remember that I think that if you saw like online, if you're actually keen, you've been seeing Tanzanians laughing at us and saying that the only thing that Kenyans need know how to do is to speak English. Yeah, and beg for food. <laughs> so embarrassing. So when the president goes out there and begs India to give us food, begs uh, countries that are, you know, desert countries like the Emirates, to give us food, to give us grain. You know, Tanzania is pained because they have a lot of grain. A lot of Tanzania land is under grain. Okay, guys? So, um, we can purchase our food locally, but we choose to go outside. Because why? Probably it's more lucrative for those people who are bringing the food in. Yeah? <laughs> Obviously, why? why else? Yeah? Maybe because buying regionally might be a little bit more expensive. But wouldn't you rather support your own Tanzania? and Uganda rather than go and, and support people who are completely outside the continent? Think about it, guys. Hmm? So anyway, generally, what, the, the, what this video is about is the fact that we need to diversify our sources of revenue for the government of Kenya. And we need to look beyond the population of Kenya for the revenues, for taxable income. So we need to go and invest in foreign direct investment, get those 6,000 6, people back. I believe that we have private sector and they know how to do this job, okay? And we, we, we don't believe that business, government should be in the business of doing business. Government should be an enabler of business, otherwise there will be a conflict of interest, okay? Which will not be mutually beneficial. There'll be a conflict of interest if, biz if the government is doing business and the business people are doing business, obviously, yeah, we know that the big man will do better than the small man. So what I wouldn't say, and, or small woman, so what I want to say is we need to take seriously foreign direct investment. We need to take seriously tourism dollars. We need to take seriously our security. We need to take seriously cost of energy, cost of production. Okay, we need to take seriously um, the cost of doing business. The, our our human resources not let's not play around with our human resources like like that because it's easy to send people away it's more difficult to bring them back home so you're better off with an educated population that can support the companies and we need to listen to the business people i also saw some uh, business people had been interviewed and they said that they're happy to work with kenyans because there's a lot of talent and also the infrastructure has been built in the country but the problem is that when we're charging excess duty for for example chocolate makers such as dairyland chocolate makers such as dairyland they want to produce chocolate in the country something that hasn't been done before we know that we lost cadbury's they tr they went actually i think it was to egypt hmm? so now here is dairyland with a gentleman called mr shah who is trying to to make chocolates in the country when he's interviewed he says if i have to pay excise duty and then i also have to pay all these duties come on guys this is a new business i'm trying to create jobs once we create jobs and we start creating chocolate then we start selling chocolate selling the final product we're talking about value added value addition when we add value to the products what it means is that it brings income and foreign exchange to the country so let's look at trying to help businesses to produce finished products which we can now sell and then get money back this is what china does and this is what china did actually during the lockdown period immediately after lockdown the chinese government invested heavily in the small and micro enterprise businesses they gave them so many concessions, so many tax, tax, you know, tax exemptions for them. And this is exactly what we should be doing. And this is why so many people try to set up business, even the people from the UK here, they try to set up business in countries like Dubai where they don't charge taxes. So in Kenya, instead of increasing the taxes, we should be reducing the taxes, the tax burden on the businesses because we know they are the ones who keep people in employment. It's not the business of the government to be looking for jobs, okay, for Kenyans. Kenyans are very capable of looking for jobs for themselves and the businesses are able to support those Kenyans. So on that note, thank you so much 
I'll try to be keeping my videos a little bit shorter. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you for subscribing. Please remember to thumbs up this video and uh, to subscribe. And thank you so much for your time. Let's talk next time. And Happy New Year again. Toodles. Bye-bye.